So let me officially invite you everyone to our today's webinar on data trends in HR practices. So myself, Krishna Priya, working as co course associate course leader in Uni Athena Global Education. And uh, we are leading partners, leading providers of online master courses and doctorate courses. We have a well uh, distinguished guest today, Mario Brazzoli, who is currently the human resource lead of, for the chief operations office at ING Netherlands and uh, one of our DBA students at Uni Athena. Mario is an international HR professional with over 18 years of human resource experience in role changing from business partnering to specialized work in various centers of excellence with experience across financial services, retail and telecommunication. And he has a lot of exposure in various landscapes such as Africa, European, Latin, America, Middle East, India, and Southeast Asia. So I invite you, Mario, for our session. So our learn uh, participants are responding to our icebreaker question, as you can see. So there are a lot of opinions coming up. Some say that data analytics tool is required to improving the work-life balance or there are suggestions to uh, providing that they need HR data for team building activities. So you can see those answers in the chat box and maybe we can start from here. Over to you, Mario. Thank you so much. Shall I move on and give them a chance at the second icebreaker as well? Yeah. So our second icebreaker question is, according to you, what is one of the potential benefit of applying data science techniques in HR? Please provide your answers in the chat box. We are waiting for your answer for your second icebreaker question. According to you, what is one potential benefit of applying data science techniques in HR? Yes, we got an answer uh, like team building. Ahmad says HR, uh, easiness of HR works. So mostly people, uh, are looking forward for data trends for team building, easiness of HR processes, quality of service is another answer. So our learners are responding with a lot of answers here. Very nice to see. All right, shall I take over? Yes, Mario, thank you. Over to you, Mario. All right, so... Uh... A warm welcome to everyone, and uh, especially wherever you may be joining. Um, really nice to have you uh, join us today for today's session. I think we've got quite an exciting session, a follow-up on the previous session we've had on uh, the impact of data trends on the role of human resources. So this is kind of version number two or 2.0. Um, so looking forward to sharing that with you. Um, so maybe just a little bit about myself. So uh, Mario Brazzoli, so Italian, grew up in South Africa. I currently have the absolute pleasure of uh, being part of ING, where I get to lead an awesome group of HR business partners. So my career journey has been a, a mixture of human resources and, and leading transformation. And then obviously, I think as uh, Krishna mentioned, experiencing consulting retail telecoms and specifically across the financial uh, services industries. And then I think uh, the part that I really have enjoyed over my career is, is being able to walk, work in different uh, geographic locations and with different cultures across you know, Africa, Asia, uh, Middle East, and Europe. So um, really, really awesome. So a little bit about me and, and who I am, and uh, let me uh, jump into the context. So one is, as I mentioned, I think uh, we, we did a similar session maybe not a year ago, but you know, September last year, it's almost a year ago, and this is kind of version two of it. But maybe just to take a, a moment to look back at what we spoke about previously and, and how we kind of intertwine today's conversation into that. So last time we looked back at HR and specifically how the role of, of human resources have kind of changed over the, over the time period. Then we spent a bit of time on just understanding what is data science and what does it mean for us. Then we looked at some of the, the HR trends and, and how they are changing. And at that stage, we spoke specifically 
about how hybrid working is changing our landscape, how automation is changing our landscape, you know, some of the trends that, you know, sitting is the new smoking, you know, and how sitting in the, the hybrid kind of workspace is, is impacting our lives, but also about what's needed from diversity and equity and inclusion in, in the people space. And then I think the big topic that's taking more and more relevance is around sustainability and what does that mean for us as uh, HR practitioners and, and organizations. And then the last part that we try to do is link some of the data trends and how that interfaces or, or has application for, for human resources. And then we saw conversations about how we're seeing a little bit of a shift from big data to smaller data. In other words, how do we make the data that we have really meaningful um, instead of trying to get as much as we possibly can? Um, also, how do we use a data-driven approach both from a customer but also an employee experience perspective? We spoke about the big convergence in the sense of how do we take all these different elements and create smart homes, smart, smart offices, and those kind of um, aspects. Um, the no coding machine learning, which I think is fascinating that we're starting to see some applications come out where you don't have to be a coder to create um, machine learning applications. And then naturally, the big advantage is about predictive analysis for us, right? How do we start using what we have to start giving us a feel for, for what the future holds? And so that's a little bit of the aspects that we spoke about. Just to highlight again some of the key learnings. So, I mean, we're going to talk about this again today about how data is an organizational capability. And I think that's one of the, the most important key uh, outcomes we, we want to land with you. Um, also around the use of the small and wider data, as I think we mentioned before this meaningful uh, employee experience through data, um, you know, what does the big convergence mean for HR? And then naturally, you know, when we talk about data, we have to talk about, you know, the ethics and the privacy that um, is associated with that. So hopefully that should remind many of you that had the privilege of, uh, of joining our previous session. I think it's good to just uh, keep this in mind as we, as we go through the journey. So, Let's talk a little bit about what we what we want to speak about today. So if you think about last time, we spoke quite high level or quite an overview perspective on this. So what we first want to land again is what is data science? What are we talking about when we talk about data science? And then I thought it would be really nice if we just started fine tuning this a little bit and, and bringing this into a sliver in, in the people agenda in a sense of work or what does the job mean? And, and then we want to look about how the concept of a job has changed over time. And then look about, you know, what does that mean for organizations? If we look at how jobs are changing and how data can impact this, what does that mean from a skill-based organization? And then how does these trends enable us to, uh, to change and become these future and skill-based uh, uh, organizations that we, we see spring up more and more and more in our context? So that's a bit of a feel on, on the things that we cover. But I think it's also quite nice. We, we've got three polls that will play out through the session, which hopefully will also be able to, to keep you involved. All right, so the first topic, what is data science? So, I mean, I think the, the most easiest answer here is data science is the study of data. But it's really about how do we use data to get meaning from it? Um, you know, whether it's structured or unstructured, how do we use it so we can gain some insights um, and, and turn the most essence of data into something that we can get meaning from and, uh, and improve and impact the world around us? So data science is then really built on four critical pillars. So how do we turn data into information? How do we analyze it to, to get insights? How do we then turn that into understanding what the correlations or patterns or trends is from that context base we have. And I think my most fundamental aspect is how do we can contextualize that or turn that back into well, how does it change or impact our understanding of a scenario? So even if we think about this from a people perspective, uh, we sit on large amount of, of people-oriented data. How do we turn that analysis into insights? How do we look at patterns and predictive capability about it? But also, how do we use that to shape our context or what are we seeing in the workplace? What are we seeing globally or, or across the world to, to take meaning and, uh, and hopefully impact the lives of our, of our people? So if we look at the evolution of data, you know, the story kind of starts, and, and I like that it starts in Africa, a little bit of my roots. And, uh, you know, a stick was found, which is called the Shiango bone. 
which was found the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, roughly about 10 centimeter in, in width, and uh, they found various markings on it to indicate how it was used to record counting. So that's the kind of first uh, base that we find a long, long time ago. And then we see kind of some of the literature that came through in the 1600s, where uh, a publication of John Grant, and I think this is such a fundamental example of how we use data. And, and what he did was looked at the birth and the causes of death and death um, sort of documentation, the various London parishes. And, and from that, he was able to start connecting two events. In other words, what is the difference between you know, birth and death and how do we from that create life expectancy um, and so on. So again, as how do we use basic data to turn it into some sort of insights and then, you know, if I think of life, life expectancy, turn it into a predictive capability. Another very interesting part in the history was in the 18th century um, where there was a competition for designing and the ability to record census data, in other words, accounting of a population of a grouping. Um, there, there were three contestants that built various mechanisms to, to handle the counting. And the mechanism that, uh, that Herman built, which I think was fascinating, reduced the counting speed from 144 hours to, to count the various ballots to 72 hours, which is quite a significant reduction. But I think the part that was fascinating, which is the real meaning of what we, what we want to see in data and data science, is how do we turn that back into meaning? So in other words, how do we categorize what we counted into aspects like age, gender, et cetera? we reduced it from 44 hours into 5.5 hours. Um, so thinking about how far back some of the base concepts of, of the science goes. The same we saw, which I think the magnetic tape was an instrumental aspect that, that led to, and I think many of you might not remember what a floppy disk and a, and a hard drive or, or a hard disk is, uh, but the, the first kind of recordings or, or storage capabilities really allowed us to start capturing and holding and also analyzing larger quantity of data. Um, this naturally resulted in inventions like the, the tape recorder, et cetera, et cetera. So a fundamental shift in it. In the 1990s, we saw obviously the World Wide Web that fundamentally changed it. If you think about some of the search engine capabilities that we have today and how it filters through mass amount of data to give us um, some sort of perspective and how that's kind of evolved. Then in the early 2000s, we saw the boom of the dot-com, uh, where it really was about how we take organizations online. Um, and we saw through a, a very short period, nearly all services turning into some sort of electronic or digital uh, version, um, a fascinating part of a journey. And later on, we saw the evolution of the Amazons, the Netflix, and how the service industry really transformed from a customer experience and how we use data to, uh, to improve the customer experience throughout the value chain. And later on, we saw some additional um, distractors or disruptors in the market with Airbnb and Uber and about how we use these different data capabilities um, on our cell phone and created this on-demand economy. Uh, we later on in the 2015 saw the, the kind of birth of or the really advancements of machine learning and AI where that kind of intensified what our capability was and what we can do and the speed in which we can use data on a daily basis. And the 2020s, I think, over the last while, what we've just seen the, the pandemic had a massive intensified uh, you know, adoption rate for people as, uh, as many people had to work from home and that really was instrumental in bringing the, the virtual life up alone. And I mean, if we had, had another dot, dot at the horizon, I think the launch of ChatGTP and what that means for us from a, uh, industry and uh, in our daily lives is, is fascinating and how these various instruments is impacting far greater than just the pure science of data management. So if we look a little bit about the application of data science, just to make it a bit more tangible for, for the audience. So yeah, I mean, if I think about the banking industry, you know, typically for us, you know, anomaly detection and how do we, um, you know, over mass amount of accounts and transactions, are able to highlight um, or, or red light specific um, anomalies. Um, so maybe fraud and could be fraud crime, et cetera. Uh, automation and decision-making. I think, you know, if we take examples like credit worthiness or background checks, et cetera, um, this plays a critical role. Classification, and I mean, I think this is what I always found fascinating is about 
how simplistic actually it is. Just the ability to sort your emails into what's important and what goes into the junk folder. I mean, this is some of the essence stuff of the of the capability of data science. And forecasting, maybe sales or customer retention, pattern detection. You know, this is maybe for labor uh, retention, financial market patterns, etc. We were really seeing some some wonderful growth also about the recognition capability, maybe facial or text um, or voice recognition capabilities. And then I think as simple as, uh, which we I think we're seeing more and more, more is the recommendation capability where, um, you know, these various engines can can help look at our preferences and our previous choices to uh, create recommendations for movies, books, and so on. I think recently Bookings.com also launched through ChatGDPP where you can even put in your preferences and create a planner for your holiday and make suggestions on places and areas you should see or what accommodation would most likely uh, suit your uh, your interests. So really exciting what's happening in space and the application is, is just so incredibly wide. And I think this gives us a wonderful moment to take a pause and uh, Krishna, shall we uh, launch the first poll? Yes, we have a first poll here, so all the participants can uh, provide your answers in the poll. So our first poll question is, do you believe it is possible to effectively split people from jobs through automation and technology? So we are getting responses. So please provide your answer in the poll. This is going to be amazing result. <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll just have the. I hope everybody has participated. I can see almost fifty percentage of the participants have already posted it. So uh, let's wind up the post and I'll display the results. I hope uh, every all our participants have participated. I can wind up the poll. Okay. Nishi, you can see on the screen uh, for the poll. Okay. So this is the last minute for the poll. Okay. So Mario, I'm sharing the results. You can see that 84% of our participants believe that uh, automation and technology can effectively split people from jobs. Excellent. So we've still got to convince 16%. I'm sure we can do that in the next part of our session. <laughs> okay. So let me stop now. Over to you. Excellent. Okay. So the next part is, so we think about it, we, we, we laid a little bit of foundation on what data science is and what the capability of that is and, and why some of those trends are so important for the application. Um, of various fields, but also what that capability can do for us. So the next part of the conversation, we want to speak a little bit about work and, and how work has changed fundamentally over, over time. So you talk about how that fundamental concept of job has absolutely fundamentally shifted through, through our time period. And I mean, we go back to roots, you know, the early roots talks about survival and, and specialization. And here we talk about the, the hunter, and gather a kind of concept, right? So these were very specialized concepts of, you get one group to focus on one aspect and some, some specialize on becoming a hunter versus a, the gatherer. And it's kind of our first indication of what different roles or jobs are within community. Then obviously we saw the industrial revolution really start formalizing roles with working hours, working conditions, um, and really start framing work in a very, very formalized, structured kind of manner. Um, then post-World War II, we saw a little bit of a stabilization where individuals really entered um, jobs as careers. Um, and there, the, the need for aspects like job security became fundamental to the workplace. Also, we saw a big shift in the change of formal employment or, or stability with formal employment uh, arrangements um, and aspects around employment safety, et cetera, et cetera, on, on various conditions. And this obviously led us to, to more recent times. We saw a massive amount of techno technological advancements 
with automation and shifting roles. We think about how automation from the maybe from simplistic aspects like uh, for factories um, to you know more corporate environments or, or more service industry environments where automation is fundamentally shifted. And uh, I mean, I recently went to a restaurant where they, there's a, a robot waiter that kind of drives around and delivers the food or takes orders. And you think of those basic automation, repetitive tasks and how that, that changed what a job is or the concept of it. And then we've seen a massive shift over the last while of globalization and this concept of the gig economy. And again, a reminder to, to all of those, the gig economy really talks about how environments that really rely on the you know, variations of types of jobs. So in other words, having the variations of temps and part-timers and contractors and freelancers and how a workplace is built up of all these variety of skills. And if you think about, you know, post kind of World War II, where job security and formal careers became very important, in this gig economy, we're seeing how flexibility and uncertainty becomes more uh, a need for both employees and, and employers uh, themselves. And then we're obviously going into a landscape where skills-based or adaptive workforce, in other words, this is where individuals fundamentally have different kind of careers, where you know, the assertion of skills and skills become a valuable entity or, or asset itself and how that is shifting and changing um, across the, the landscape. So, so here we see really a, a shift in, in, in how we look at what an actual job is from very specialization to more formalized careers to now we're going to a very fluid and a, a, and a more skill-based kind of approach to, to looking at roles and, and jobs itself. So I think there's a wonderful book that was published on it, and for anyone that uh, wants to read more on the concept, I think it's fascinating. So the two authors, John and Ravin, really laid out some, some really some great base dynamics on, on what the future of work looks like and, and what that means. And, and a big part of this is the whole concept of it it takes us to fundamentally rethink our operating model or how we construct ourselves as an organization um, and lay down new foundations on, on how we build capabilities and what we consider as job holders. And this is where I think the data concept there plays such a critical role in helping us achieve this in, in enabling the future work. So let's just play out what this means. And I think the authors use a, a wonderful metaphor when they start talking about this change in, in, in work and what does that mean? And it talks about having that fluidness of constructing and deconstructing and reconstructing jobs. And they use the, the, the metaphor of an ice block. And if you think about like an ice block and an ice tray, you can melt it down into water and then refreeze it into different shapes and different sizes. And on the same basis, if you think about what a job is, a job is the ability to have certain skills to perform a specific grouping of, of tasks. And that way you should be able to melt down that job into what are the key skills of that role and reorganize it based on what you might need throughout the organization. And this, you know, creating this fluidity through an organization, the ability to unfreeze and refreeze or deconstruct and reinvent specific jobs based on their skills fundamentally changes our landscape in how we prepare for jobs, right? Because now it's not necessarily whether I'm an accountant, it's that I have specific skills that I can apply in various job settings. And this talks about the increasing importance to gain and build skills over time, but also from an organization perspective, to really understand what skills are required for which activities that we perform throughout the organization. So. Again, making this a little bit practical on, on what does this look like and which organizations have done, done some aspects. And I think one of the examples I've, I've seen personally, which I think you know, happened back 2010, a little bit before 2010, in an organization called Netcare, which is a, a healthcare organization in, in South Africa. But I think Providence has done something similar quite recently, which uh, is, is a US-based uh, healthcare organization. And yeah, a little bit of the storyline or the challenge base for, for HR practitioners is, you know, where you find a climate where there's a mass short shortage of specific qualified individuals or occupations. In this case, for example, a mass shortage of, of nurses. And, and this shortage is naturally, you know, created by 
um, multiple social economic reasons where there's fluctuations or, or movement of people through, um, you know, across borders, but also, you know, how we remunerate or reward different individuals and we see the kind of movement where uh, we, we see in different industries that, that change. So in its base, mass shortage of nurses, nurses playing obviously the healthcare industry a fundamental role in, in patient care. And here, what uh, the, the HR teams did, which I think is absolutely remarkable, is they took the role of a nurse and broke it down into its fundamental um, activities that it performed. So what they realized when they broke this down and broke this data down is then there's some fundamental administrative um, tasks that could be streamlined through automation that could be taken out of this role. They also found that, you know, there are services that a nurse does, like, for example, providing you know, patients with, uh, with, with, with medicine and stuff like that, it could be created in a self-service uh, capability. So self-medicine, in other words, they can go and collect the medicine themselves, but also pairing nurses with care workers. There's some task like, for example, bathing a, a, a patient that doesn't require someone to be a qualified nurse. So how do you make sure you use those skills for the key duties that are created with it? And that allowed them to create various categories required for that role in reducing the number of actual qualified nurses they have, but also improving the actual work of, of a nurse in that industry. So again, I think a fundamentally great example of taking a current role as we understand it and how we would traditionally put it in a job description and breaking it down into its fundamental parts and saying, it's right, which of those parts can we do through different aspects or, or different variations? which I think is really fascinating and a, a great example of, of this kind of um, deconstructing and reinventing of, of, of roles themselves. All right, so that takes us to a, a perfect opportunity to jump into poll two. Yeah, I'll have the poll two now. Let me uh, launch the poll. So I guess all participants are ready for our poll two. Please check on your uh, site for your polls. So your poll two question is, how important do you believe data literacy skills are becoming for HR professionals? So all participants, please participate in our poll two question. You can select the answers. Please provide your opinions among the options provided. You can see your poll in your quest, uh, screen. You can select any option. So we are getting a uh, active participation here, I can see that it is like around 70% of uh, participants have already posted their answer. So rest of the learners, please do participate in the uh, polls so that we can know what is your belief regarding the data literacy skills. Do you feel uh, data literacy skill is very important for an HR professional? How important it is? Please give your votes. Here's yeah, some great comments coming through and uh, the importance yes. of it, and maybe not to influence the outcome, but I think, uh, <laughs> you know, for the audience, we've got a, a great group. I mean, I think we're just over 770 now. Of uh, on, on the on the call, but yes. I think what's fascinating is depending on where you are in your journey. I think for those of of you that are entering the workplace and kind of entering the, the the marketplace, you know, if I think about how fundamentally human resources has changed over the last five to ten years, and how much data and data analysis plays in in creating these and hopefully creating these incredible employee experiences, it becomes a fundamental part. But I think for also for those of us that are as gray as I am, 
you know, being in the field for, for, for multiple years, it's also so critical for us to, to stay, you know, abreast with what changes in this field because it's changed how we operate, what we do, um, and, and how we use different tools to, to make an impact so uh, fundamentally. Okay, Mario, uh, thank you for that insight. Uh, so almost 78% of our participants has now voted. So I'll, I would like to share the results to you and then you can give your opinion on the answers that is going to come. Yeah, so I think great insight. 80 percent I think extremely important. 83% so says it is extremely important. So from your yeah. experience, what do you say? Yeah, I think for me, it's it's absolutely extremely important. Um, I mean, I think specifically in the large organizations, what we're seeing is the entire management of the employee experience is, is kind of indicative through what we see in the data. Uh, looking at the employee's entire life cycle of how employees experience the recruitment journey to the onboarding journey to eventually um, the offboarding um, experience and um, you know and how data and data management tools play a critical role in doing that um, especially when we start looking at scale and creating um, cost effective ways of of creating incredible employee experiences and i think it's even more critical when we start talking about customer experience right so uh, I mean, uh, I think from an HR perspective, our internal employee is our customer. So indicatively in the sense of, of who we, we're trying to create experience for. Thank so you, Mario. Good. And thank you all the participants for uh, taking part in the poll too. Over to you, Mario. Let's come all back right. to our So let's, let's put the, the context back here. So we spoke about what data science means and how we kind of, how we, how we make that applicable with, within, within various fields. We spoke a little bit about this concept of the skill-based organization and how the need is to, to kind of reinvent roles and looking at it from a skill perspective. And the next part is really about how do we start changing people in the sense of, you know, disassociating them from a specific job title, but bring them back to a skill base. So how do we look at individuals from a skill set, not necessarily from someone is a specific occupation or job title um, in our traditional way of, 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 of analyzing roles. And for this, there's some various insights. And I think there's some four key concepts that I think is very interesting in this space. And, and the first starts with the, the, or the first principle starts with work. In other words, really taking it back to what is the future of work. In other words, the actual activities we need to perform um, and not starting with the existing jobs. And I think that's such a critical differentiator to create this fluidness and structures. And here we see various examples of it. And one, Tata Steel, which I think did an incredible um, example of it, where when they looked at what individuals from a perspective of a skill base, so if you look at the data on what skill capabilities individuals have um, in comparison to looking purely from a, a job title or, or, or job perspective, they were able to identify or match up uh, over a thousand projects um, in the organization to their current workforce from a skill match perspective and unlocked an additional 175,000 hours um, of capability in the, in the organization to perform critical projects that they needed. Now, I mean, this is an incredible talk about optimizing and best usage of it. So, I mean, the first thought is, all right, well, maybe we are abusing or overusing or, or over workloading on individuals. But what it also means is, you know, as individuals, we aren't necessarily just one skill. We also have interests across a variety of this. I think what Tata Steele also found was, you know, this creates more job enjoyment for individuals by being able to have the opportunity to work on various projects and being able to use a variety of their skill bases. I mean, another great example, which I mean is, is so straightforward, but I mean how, how critical it was specifically over the corona period when we see changing in the markets, where Papagonia um, you know, looked at the skill bases of store associate, uh, associates, so these are individuals that obviously sat in the actual uh, retail stores versus the skills needed on the online retail platform. So in other words, when you phone in or... Um, might make an order or have a query online. 
And, and what they were able to do is to shift these individuals in a more fluid way to be able to, depending on demand, uh, respond to, to customer queries online versus being able to serve customers in stores. And if you think about just that impact of, you know, retail specifically where, you know, you're the closing down of stores, which impacts people's lives as they go through restructures and redundancies. And in this way, where organization was able to protect that workforce to create that fluidity between different services, different customer needs, which I think is a great example where, you know, that kind of level of analysis allows us to, to use it across bases. And once we're able to take it away from a job, to what the skill base and associate skill base is with these various roles. Um, I think the second principle talks about looking at the full array of, of uh, human engagement. And I think this really talks about this, this kind of gig economy. And, and when we develop our workforce, we so traditionally look at you know, our permanent employees is who works for us. And in the modern era now, what we're seeing is the workforce I have is actually includes my team temporary labor workforce, my contractors, my freelancers, my part-time workers. So the concept of the workforce is expanding much wider uh, because it's also the freelancers and contractors that service our customers or creates or impacts our brand. So how do we really create a, a unified portfolio of it? Um, so one is from how we create a culture and a brand, but also how do we look at the skill bases we have across all these different mechanisms of work to best service or, or best enable the organization? Um, and this can be a great way then if, if we, from a data perspective, look at the fundamental skills we have today we need for the future over transition periods, where's the best kind of labor aspects to identify or to attract those various skill bases, um, and then create a fundamental way of uh, of creating it. I mean, here yeah, also just if looking at the research and, the, and specifically the work around creating that autonomy, you know, there is still feelings across large landscapes where, you know, individuals that aren't necessarily in formal arrangements of work still don't necessarily feel like they are part of it or, or, or been able to uh, build unique skills. Um, and often, you know, I think we, we associate things still with a lot more with traditional uh, roles. But it's, it's really about how do we kind of share and build that across skill base, specifically across all these various uh, options or variations of, of work itself. And then our third principle looks at, you know, really how do we use this and specifically data and data engines to help us create this flow of work or talent or skill sets um, across the organization. So again, moving away from traditional work, but how do we use the skill sets and create fluidity of, of individuals and the skills um, and not just limited to how much we have of certain occupations or, or, or key roles um, in the organization. And here we see some, some amazing uh, shifts. And I think one of the fascinating things, just to give you a feel for what's shaping outside the market, is a joint venture between the World Economic Forum, Google and Amazon that's taking place at the moment where they're working together about creating a global taxonomy for skills to also allow this on a, on a global scale on how do we build specific skills for specific markets, but how do we really utilize it? And, and if you think about the concept of it is we're breaking it down into pieces, which becomes all those data points. And I think the, the advancements in data science is now allowing us to be able to break it down into those pieces and resort it very similar to if you think about the census concept of, of Herman uh, in the, you know, with how do you count it? And secondly, how do you resort it into different categories? And having been able to have a single taxonomy of standardizations on a global basis allows us to build these various skill hubs where engines can run in the sense of how do we best suit uh, certain skills to, to, to what's needed in it. And this requires a bit of, you know, governance around how we do it, but also the technological advances that we see in the field. So really an interesting point where some core people aspects is combining with what we've seen from a technology and a shaping perspective. All right, and I think the, the fourth principle that we'll spend quite a bit of time with um, next is really about how do we find these optimum, you know, kind of 
co-working or combinations between human and automation. Um, so it's gone as the days of it's uh, a human versus the machine. It's now really about how do we you know, co co-create or, or collaborate in a way where it makes the most meaning. Um, and we see that, I think, specifically from our HR space and what's the other role of HR is changing when we try and find the optimum versions on, on how to combine this. And I think skill base is an essential part of it, but also how we're able to use data science to, to reshift our ability to, to play around with this and, and reshape this. So, so we'll dig in through a little bit of the practices. I think that uh, could be a nice way of illustrating how some of the data science and technology aspects is changing some fundamental people practices and in way we look at it. So uh, next session specifically our data trends and how this is creating the shift and uh, the reality is the shift is happening. And I think the first one talking about deploying skills at work. So again, in our, in our current, current settings, we still see a lot of role place, vertical or horizontal move through, you know, depending on individual's job experience. We now we're starting to see a bit of a move to AI helping us match skills to teams um, inside and outside of the organization. And MasterCard is a great example where they use an AI to, tool um, to help them uh, shape the talent marketplace. So in other words, when we break individuals and look at individuals from a skill-based perspective, how do we use AI to start matching what skill sets we are versus the different kind of roles or activities we need to perform within the organization, creating that matching. Um, so obviously in an era where an individual or HR practitioner had to try and do some of these matching manually or, or, or from their own analysis of, of individuals, now we're seeing how AI plays a key role in helping us shape that and, and match opportunities to, um, and also the, the construct of teams. Um, so this becomes quite complex in its base, but it's fascinating to see, and I mean, I think MasterCard is really playing a great role in shifting that market. The next, if we think about the hiring, I think this is really interesting. Um, the first base, we think of the previous example of MasterCard, where we think of the matching capability. But here, what I think is so fascinating is where we move away from traditional job experience and education as a marker for, for what when we look at talent. What we're now starting to look at is how do we look at skill sets uh, to match up? And now, and I think IBM has coined this new concept of the new collar. And new collar basically means where we're saying is certain backgrounds or certain skill sets are similar to or similar in skill sets to some of the core things we need. So for example, you know, this is where we talk, you know, a data scientist, for example, and a data uh, analyst uh, or, or analytics uh, specialist might have very similar base capability or skill sets. And therefore, you can use one field for another. The same, you might be able to say an HR professional and a change management expert has similar capabilities at the core, and therefore, you should be able to use one across to the other. And I think that is really interesting in the sense of what it holds. And I think from an MBA perspective, where half of their new jobs, they focus on the right skill, which they talk about the new collar, where the high individuals that aren't necessarily professionals in a specific stream. Um, and I think that, yeah, fascinating and what this will bring for us. The next, looking at development and careers, and I think this is probably the one I get the most excited about. Um, I think for, for many of us out in the field, you know, it becomes something you have to um, self-engineer on your own development and when you look at your career path. And, you know, we, we, we're seeing organizations like, for example, Novaritas, which is also a global healthcare provider, um, bringing in AI assistance where they mine employee skills and interest, and they help identify roles that match skill sets and uh, in interest of individuals, and then recommend or propose roles in the organization wherever they think the employee is a match fits. And if you think about it, it's almost similar to the concept of Netflix, where you would have an AI capability propose or recommend certain videos or certain movies or, 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 or series to you based on your career path or the roles that you've previously performed. Um, and I think that's just fascinating in the sense of opening up new opportunities, but also uh, help individuals steer and engineer um, their path and, and helping them reshape. 
What it also, I think, really allows for great opportunity, which is also the part that we, we want to, is helping individuals understand where is their skill gaps, and where are the skills that if they closed out, they would open up specific opportunities that either links to the interest or um, how they make themselves more viable and, uh, and interesting for the future. So really a nice shift that we're seeing in this space. And, uh, and then again, the essence is being able to mine mass amount of data and reuse it. And I think from an HR perspective, how we kind of use this to, um, to help create a, a more pleasant or, or, or positive employee experience for colleagues. All right, next we see in performance management. Yeah, I think it's also a, a really fascinating. And we're seeing this in, in small amounts of, of organizations are changing, but Google is a great example of it. Where, you know, I think traditionally we really looked at, you know, the job performance of individuals, but we're seeing a bit of the shift now happening. You know, I think originally it was really about the, the what and the how, but now we're also seeing an element being weaved into these conversations about individuals learning agility and ability to develop skills and, and, and continuously grow their skill bases becoming as, as important. And similarly, as we always used to take as well, if we're doing the right things or behaving in a, in a certain way, therefore we expect to see results. A similar way we're starting to understand is if we build certain skills and capability in the organizations, we are expecting that that is the right levers to produce the right results for an organization for the future. And I mean, a great example of this is like innovation, where you know, seeing innovation take place is almost an event after a mass amount of other levers being pulled. So being able to build that entrepreneurial or innovation skill sets within the organization, we know will lead to a climate where we create more um, innovation and, uh, and future capability for the organization. All right, the next one, recognition and, and rewards. And I think this is another example where IBM is, is playing ahead. Um, again, thinking of this so, I think this is a fascinating field where traditionally we really looked at jobs and levels and grade levels and salary kind of bands in how we look at adjustments and, and value of roles. So when we do market salaries, you'll typically see as you know, an, an HR business part and an HR manager and an HR lead and, and what kind of uh, salaries is connected to that. Where if you build it or break it down into a sub layer of that, where you look at specific skills, what remuneration and comparative remuneration is based on the skills. Then we can really look at what is the skill set that becomes scarce um, and what cluster of skills become scarce in the market and how we value that as an organization and in turn remunerate that and incentivize that from a skill-based perspective. Again, a fundamental shift move and again, only possible through the ability to mine mass data, turn that into insights, be able to take uh, context from it and, uh, and help us predict how we use that for, for the success of the organization. Next, talking about, about workforce planning, um, another a really interesting one in the sense that we, we spoke about the example earlier from Netcare, but Providence doing something similar where we looked at specific skill sets required to obtain specific licenses. And here we see different markets, different examples for it. In the healthcare industry, typically individuals would need specific skill sets to be able to um, renew their, 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 their um, nursing license. In the banking industry, I can think of similar things where you would need certain skill sets to be licensed or credited as specific, you know, your client um, aspects or working with specific products like mortgages or home loans. Um, and here it's really about how do we break that down again and, and reformulate that, but also being able to break it down so we use it for the right aspects and also being able to predict what we need in its current format and need for the, the, the future. I think any HR professional would say to you, it would be exceptional to have that level of, of, of detail when we start looking at predicting what we need from a skill set for the future. Um, and the meaning for that from an employee perspective is also what skills do I need to stay relevant in a marketplace two, three, four years down the line. I think it's an incredible advancement and, and will give us a lot of additional service capability offerings. Next, obviously from a job architecture, which I think is probably critical or fundamental to the base of this conversation, right? 
So really about how do we, you know, take the static job-based competency hierarchy levels and, and careers as we understand it at the moment, start breaking this down into more simpler sets of aspects on, on what the role means and how you then advance your skill base to, you know, move through a career journey or move through, a, um, you know, what you would like to achieve from, from your journey to uh, not to necessarily a, a very structured formal route where you become a uh, you know HR administrator to an HR officer to an HR manager to an HR director, where this is a lot more about how do you create fluidity through the organization, organization design. But also so fundamental is how do you break this down so from an HR or from an organizational perspective, and being able to break down, down jobs and recreate it. I think anyone will tell you. The moment we start reconstructing jobs, the amount of effort and energy from, I think, from an HR perspective on writing up job descriptions and job specifications and regrading the roles and the time and energy that takes. So it also shows us about a traditional way of thinking and the practices associated with this doesn't necessarily allow us the capability to flow with the architecture or specifically a skills-based architecture to reshape the organization on a regular basis to to meet the needs of the of the future. All right, so this brings us um, quite sharply to uh, the end of the presentation. And I wanna just maybe highlight a little bit of the, the key takeaways that I would like the audience to take away from the session. So, so maybe from my perspective, first is we spoke about that last time, we spoke about it this time again, really seeing data as an organizational capability. And what do we mean with that is, the data is not a sub-department or a sub-stream, but it actually becomes a capability that's present in every single field. So similarly in human resources, what we're seeing is a lot of HR areas or environments or departments have now specialized data scientists in our teams working with us. So it becomes a key capability for us to deliver on a people agenda. It's not a specialized data service sitting somewhere in the organization. And the next is to, to when we really look at this and re-engineer to start with the work, to start with activities. You know, if it is looking at combinations between automation and, and individuals, um, and all of it's looking at skill bases. So how do we use data to help us understand the actual work? So if it's from a bottom-up or a top-down kind of analysis of the activities, but it's essential that we start there as a, as a starting point. Next is, and I think for me, this is very close to my heart, is how do we look at the full array of types of individuals in this gig economy that we make things, part-timers, contractors, freelancers, all of those different types of work part of a fundamental work experience and work engagement. So in other words, you know, not looking at just a permanent workforce, but looking at the whole array of workers as part of the integral part of the culture, part of the systems, part of the skill base that we want to develop, grow, and invest in, um, and not just the permanent base, which I think is really interesting for what we might see in the future. Then allowing the flow of work uh, versus traditional jobs. In other words, how do we make sure that the skill sets we have in the organization, sim sim similar to the Tata Steel example, that if I have certain capabilities spread throughout the organization, how do I tap into that to to, to resolve or handle some of the projects and activities I have uh, that have strategic relevance and, and help us grow as an organization. And then lastly, I mean, again, as we, we are in this age and we see now even, I think, uh, a lot of the new articles you will see online. And I think a lot of the news articles is, for example, like chat DTPP and what does that mean for us? And I, I think the, the essence of it always comes down to how do we integrate that with human? So it's not a replacement of a person, but it starts changing and reshaping what we see as work or what's required as part of that. Um, and that also changes the skill sets we need to build as humans um, and as professionals. And, uh, and therefore, you know, my tip to everyone is lifelong learning. It's continuous learning. It's continuously trying to build your skill sets, explore new new, new skill sets and, and develop as professionals. All right, and then I'll stop there to say thank you. And I think this is also the perfect time to hand over to Krishna for our last poll. Thank you, Mario. So let's move on to the poll three. 
So all participants, we are going for the poll three, the last poll of the session. Here it is. So the poll three is about how effectively does your organization use data visualization tools to communicate HR insights? You can give your votes for the options provided. So the question I repeat, how effectively does your organization use data visualization tools to communicate HR insights? All participants are requested to take part in our last poll. So before uh, we go into the answer, I, we have a short presentation on Uni Athena. So let me share my screen. I, I hope the screen is visible to all. So let me take you all towards a small session on uh, Uni Athena to give you more information about our platform, Uni Athena. So Uni Athena is an online uh, edutech company headquartered in UK. We were started in 2019. We offer online academic courses as well as free learning short courses in an affordable way. We have a good number of partnerships at various universities across the globe. So you can see our partnership uh, partners are UCAM, Aberte, Galileo Marconi University, SQA, Acacia, CMI, CIQ. So these are our different partners. And we offer academic programs as well as short learning courses. Our academic programs involve master courses, doctorate pro uh, programs, and various MBA programs. And our short courses involve small uh, capsule-like modules, which consist of like basics, essentials, mastering, diploma, executive diploma, and MBA essentials. So why we recommend Uni Athena? It is because of flexible payment. We offer 100% online uh, learning. Our all video materials through learning tutorials, everything is available online. And it is self-paced. Okay, you can learn at your own convenient time and place. And we are accredited to the best university partners across the world. And we also deliver courses in a module way and there is a option for all our learners to connect with a personal tutor and to get guidance on their learning process. So we offer our courses in an online way, but bite-sized delivery, you can see the lessons okay, are made available to our learners through recorded video lessons, okay? And then we have something called the reading materials where the learner can have a, a textual description of what is already taught in the video lecture. And then we have something called the additional uh, resources, which are actually case studies, okay, journal papers that are available to the topic they are related, okay. And then we have reference materials, which are provided for extra reading and getting more knowledge on the topic. So for any, um, in and
and for admissions you can log on to uh, you can uh, mail to our admission team admissions at uniathena.com or reach out to our admissions manager fatima at uniathena.com so all participants can note our note down our email id for inquiring about the different courses that you were asking in our chat box okay so let me come back to our polls and share our results i hope everybody has now participated and this is the result can everybody see the results and we can see that 35 percent says very effectively they are using data visualization tools for hr insights and 43 percentage of people says that they moderately use it and 23 percentage people say that they are not very effectively using hr data analytics tools for hr practices now let's go back to your questions we have a lot of questions mario to discuss here i i think you have already checked in the q and a box you can see uh, a lot of questions running here so i'll take the first question from sisha i guess uh, it is regarding can you say the industrial revolution promoted the need for administrators to oversee the compliance with safety regulation throughout the job evolution and there is one more question from the same participants considering the skill based shift don't you think the use of AI will breed laziness and expertise reduction as personals will now be highly dependent on its skills for matching? Already other sectors are complaining on the effect of AI on the quality of job delivery. So over to you, Mario, for your valuable yeah, I think, uh, Shia, thank you for the question. I think uh, two great questions. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think just on the compliance, I mean, the safety of, of the workforce and I think the, the ethical and kind of privacy laws and stuff that we're doing around the workforce. I mean, again, the industrial revolution probably played a role in creating madness or chaos with that. But at the same point is it's probably laid the, the foundation for a lot of the things that we see today because of the, you know, the kind of conversations that started back in that era. I mean, even if we just think of working hours and stuff like that in a modern era. Um, so yeah, definitely, and definitely an aspect that we will continuously reform in the future. And I think it's essential that we do, specifically with our current ESG and sustainability lenses on on both our workforce and from a public perspective. Will AI be leading it? Laziness? <laughs> I think that's a, it's an interesting topic, and I'm sure lots of people will have different views. I mean, I just can't see how that it becomes the case. I think AI has fundamentally reshifted the type of work we do. Um, I think what it's transformed is aspects like the ability or the capability to have empathy, the ability to turn things to meaning, or you know, I think you know, kind of cognitive skills in the sense of how do we, you know, use cognitive problem-solving capabilities. I think these are the capabilities that will fundamentally enhance. And I, I think it's more about the fact that the type of work we do, which will fundamentally start shifting. Um, more than it is the case of, of laziness because the machine does it for us. I think the machine just creates a different kind of work, right, for us to do. Um, and ChatGPT, for example, proved that we, we launched a new AI tool. The next moment, we've created a whole new industry of type of workers, uh, which we never had a couple of months ago. So, um, yeah, I think this it actually just breeds more opportunity for us. Yeah. So moving to our second participant, Mohammed. Uh, Rahman uh, wants to know about the different apps or uh, any softwares that an HR expert can use. So if yeah, you can I mention... Mean, there's just so much out there. I mean, I always want to say is, you know, go and use the, uh, you know, the, the Google tools out there to go and look at what's out there. There's just so much tools. I mean, we naturally have big HR systems like Salesforce and Workday and those kind of capabilities. There's just so much out there at the moment. It's actually uh, quite frightening. Uh, but at the same point, it just shows we're advancing so much in the ability to use tools to, to help create positive employee experiences. 
that, um, yeah, it's, it's great to stay close to it. Okay. So I have a lengthy question from Sri Varsana. So I'll just brief out the main points. So yeah. <laughs> uh, he's asking about the work from home culture, uh, the hybrid. What are your suggestions to avoid the difficulties that are faced by HR in a hybrid and virtual uh, culture? How yeah, can yeah. you contribute on this through a data-driven exchange strategy? Yeah, Krishan, again, it's a wonderful question. I mean, I think the work from home and what that means from a cultural perspective. I mean, I think everyone in the industry is busy unpacking this and trying to take meaning from it, right? So we see on one side is accountability and we have definitely groups of populations that enjoy being away from it and, and the culture that that creates. The other side is, you know, we're losing some sense of belonging and those kind of aspects of that culture as well. So, yeah, like everything and every time we go through disruptive time periods, how do we find the right balance between it? Uh, and I think that's essential. Similarly to, you know, when we talk about the, the gig economy, um, we have now more freelancers, and I think the Netherlands is a great example, where I think it's up to 30% of the population is freelancers. Um, and that's incredible. I mean, if I think about versus Norway, where it's like 30%. Um, so, you know, these different shifts in how we like or prefer to work brings new challenges for us on how to create a common culture and a common um, sort of way of working that promotes positive experience for both our customers and our employees. So no great answer, but, you know, keep looking out at what organizations are doing. I think it's a very competitive landscape at the moment. Okay, uh, my editor, thank you for that answer. We have one another question from Augustine. He's asking, how possible will AI to limit the number of employees in an outfit in a process of making work easy? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the misconception of it, right? We often see a lot of technology and automation. We see it as we are reducing the number of employees. But, you know, in some cases, we don't reduce. We actually increase because we're creating a different service setting. So I think it's more about looking at that end-to-end -end value chain and seeing where the need is. And, and a great example of it is, is that, you know, if we think of something like AI where we use bot to respond to customers. So, you know, now a customer chats to a bot um, in, in getting feedback on a product or something like that. The consultants that work around that needs to have a greater amount of empathy because now the customer is not talking to you as the first point of contact. They're probably already frustrated with a bot by the time they get to you. So your ability to handle the more, you know, strain or, or be having a lot more empathy on how to deal with interaction or to be able to handle exceptions becomes increasingly. So, again, as I think it changes what it is. It's not necessarily reduction or a, a movement in that sense. Okay, thank you, Mario. We have two similar questions, but from two different persons. One is Ora. Uh, that uh, this participant is a recent HR graduate from a university and would like to know what are the trending roles, okay, uh, okay, that uh, the Odai should adopt or the skills that he has to in, in adopt in HR in order to be competent. And there is one more question, similar question from Jacob Holo. He is asking, how can I develop my data analytics skills in, as an HR? Yeah, so... Um... So I think this is a fascinating question in the sense of, you know, the first base for it is, is when, when I started working, you kind of had an HR administrator and an HR officer and an HR manager and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it was almost this one line of hierarchy where there's 10 of us and then two of us and then one of us at the top, sort of like a pyramid. And I think what's super exciting, but it also makes new professionals need to think differently about this. It's more of the skill set or capability within that HR structure in the sense of, you know, now entry-level HR roles could be that you work in, a, in a, a shared services capability where you build people dashboards or where you uh, look at learning solutions or, or, or so on, or where you become a data scientist in analyzing employee experience data. So that landscape of traditional roles of changed so fundamentally that it allows so much different types of streams to enter an HR community versus the original way of just joining as the, you know, 
the kind of intern to do HR administration or help with leave queries or something like that. And, and similarly, the same as to the question on how do you advance your, you know, data analytics skills with an HR perspective. Well, the only way of learning is doing. So experiment, play around with it, um, you know, look for uh, courses on it. Um, I think that's the essential part. I mean, we we only we only learn by, by doing or learning, right? Um, so I think it's essential that you look at the various things that are around, take some of the courses and apply it in your in whatever opportunity or landscape that you have available to you. Yeah. Continuous learning and updating with the tools and techniques is one. Yeah. And maybe a terrible example, if you think about an old great guy like myself, I mean, I recently did Uni Athena's course uh, recently, probably a good seven, eight months ago. I think it was on, on machine learning. Um, and again, fascinating because a lot of these training modules and, and specifically some of the smaller training modules just help stimulate our thinking, right? It helps just build a little bit of a stronger understanding about what the base is, how it works. And then it's really, I think that's comes a little bit with time on understanding how we apply that to different environments. Yes. So uh, we have similar question from Siba also. Already you have discussed that, how to build the skill hub. So I hope Siba that answers are already uh, answered your questions. Uh, we have very interesting question from Pranish Pendruka. Is there a chance of HR will replace by AI other than the emotional part of human? Yeah, I mean, again, as you, if you break human resources down into all its various functions, there are definitely some things or activities that HR does where we can enhance what we do through technology. But again, the fundamental is there will never be a replacement. There will always be a complementary to it. So these technology platforms enhances our ability to address certain trends and certain capabilities. Um, so again, as if I think of the fundamental aspect of human resources in the sense of how do we make a happier, more engaged, productive workforce that you know creates value for the future, you know, all these various technologies enable us to do that better. You know, the more data I have to have better and deeper conversations with my leaders, the better. It doesn't mean the more data there is, I have less to talk about, or I don't need to talk to them anymore. It's actually just more ammunition to have more constructive and more meaningful conversations. Thank you, Mario. And we have one another question, Benjamin. Almost similar line only, but in a different way. What skills does the HR look up? So you are an HR expert. So when you are recruiting, okay, Mario, tell tell me from your experience, what skills do you look up uh, when you are recruiting or when you are considering uh, people from jobs when you are doing an interview? Yeah. That is a question from Benjamin. I mean, again, it's always hard to pick one or two, right? And, and what kind of stands out? I mean, I, I would say one that we probably don't talk about a lot is the is the concept of learning agility. Um, you know. The, the ability to continuously learn, and you know, oftentimes we, we don't. I mean, I hear people, a lot of experts now talk about continuous learning um, instead of lifelong learning. And you know, you know, we can call things different names, but it's still the same base on the you know, ability to continuously take up and consume new knowledge bases is is critical for the future. And and again, it's like. Like everything, right? If you want to be a better sports champion or football player or or, uh, or, or, or soccer player or rugby player, whatever it might be, you know, practice makes perfect. I mean, I think we figured that out. So the same way is how do you become a better learner? Practice makes perfect, right? So uh, the more you learn, the better you get at learning. So it's essential. Yeah. So thank you, Mario. Uh, we have one question from Richard Manu. How do data trends and technological advancements impact HR's ability to support employee well-being and work-life balance? So, I mean, I think it's essential. I mean, if you think about even 10 years ago, at best, we would know what the sick leave number is. In other words, we know that 3% of the organization is ill at a time period. 
the, the quantum of data we get nowadays on different aspects on what the different reasons are and which different environments, how it connects to versus uh, workload or different changes in the organization. So I think this data trends and AI and all of that has allowed us to really be a lot more specific about how we, we look at well-being and create you know, safe or psychologically safe spaces for employees to, to react. But again, as what it takes from us as HR professionals is to turn this data into meaning, right? I mean, that's what we said is the essence of, of data science is there's so much data points, but how do we take that back and turn it into meaning, into something that we can create context and create improvement for, for, for the work life? And I mean, I, I see some of the other questions that's following is it really talks about how do we take different aspects? So how do you connect what's happening in sick leave, what's happening in labor turnover, what's happening in the organization, what's happening in the property and loss statements, what's happening in workloads or those aspects and start tying these numbers together in not just a dashboard with some graph, but meaning on how all these factors are creating a state that's either positive or negative or, or require certain mitigating actions. Thank you, Mario. Thank you for that answer. A lot of questions are coming, so I'm being uh, selective, sorry, no. participants, <laughs> because of the time limitations. Uh, so we have one similar question on that line uh, from, uh, I don't know uh, the person's name. What area has data analytics has helped HR comparing to it uh, to the previously, previous generations? What area yeah, has data I analytics? Mean, I mean, I, I, I think it's just fundamental. I mean, it's the, the, the quantum of change is just enormous. Um, mm -hmm. But... There are definitely some aspects that we also need to remember has stayed very much the same. So, you know, we spoke about learning agility now, but another thing I would say to, to students is things like, for example, of having a crucial or difficult conversation with another human being and having the ability to have a constructive conversation with another human being is essential for the future. Um, as you are rightly saying, is a lot of AI and a lot of the automation is taking out repetitive tasks, which just means that moment of having a difficult or crucial or, or challenging conversation is becoming more fundamental for you to be able to resolve, irrespective from what field of study you come from. Okay. So we have one question from Esther. Esther is using how best can data visualization be used for HR practices? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think this is one of those that is one of my uh, things I sometimes get very grumpy about because within HR, we tend to create a lot of dashboards. So, I mean, because we have so much data, and I think that's why we're talking about, you know, we're moving from, from, from big data to smaller data. We can create a 100-page presentation about just sick leave and dig in, digging deep into the data. And this, we can do the same in, in labor turnover. And ultimately, what we're looking for is a one pager. So how do we take all these various data points into creating one concise picture that gives us a feeling on the health or the health state of a specific subpart of the organization or the organization as a whole? And how do we make meaning out of those indicators? So for me, as I think the dashboards are critical to one is give us a snapshot, but also how do we turn the dashboards into a meaning, in other words, what does it mean? Um, and, and I think that's where also the HR professionals play a critical role with the dashboards. Okay, now uh, we have something related to the security concerns. So uh, a question is from some uh, attendee who is asking, how secure is HR data from online cybersecurity attack? Um, yeah, I mean, HR data, similar to customer data, is always on the threat, right? Um, and I mean, this is also where, as we advance with all these kind of technological things, data and data security play a critical role. But also we see across the globe a lot of regulatory requirements. You know, in Europe, we talk about GDPR, but we have different kind of versions in, in, in different continents. But how do we protect employee data similar to, to customer data? 
So there's also an ethical aspect of it. But, but if you think back, what is that ethical aspect is making sure we use data for what data was intended for, right? So it's also to protect the recipients that we don't misinterpret or, mis or abuse data that we do have. So it's critical and it will critical play a role for us. But you know, security and ethics kind of play hand in hand a role with our advancement. Okay, so we we have one question uh, from Betty. How do you incorporate AI into a task where your company has not at all started using it? So how do you how a company can bring AI to that? That is the question from Betty. Well, I mean, I think you know this is not necessarily an easy answer because you know every situation is a little bit different. But I think if you want to start a trend in your organization and show them these kind of aspects can advance what you're doing. It starts a little bit with researching and getting examples from other industries or other organizations using it and starting to build a business case for it, right? On how do you present it? How do you get buy-in in the organization to use it? I mean, I would say more important for me, for me is asking the key question is, what is the danger if we don't use it and in five years, we are that far behind that it becomes destructive, right? Yes. Thank you, Mario. Uh, another question from Christine. Uh, Christine says that, uh, what are those data literacy strategies that can be impactful for an organization such as manufacturing firm? Yeah, I think, look, I mean, so not just for manufacturing, but again, don't underestimate the base concept of data literacy, right? Um, I mean, so often people will say that there's a problem or a challenge in an organization, but we're unable to connect the right kind of data to actually understand the problem. And I, and I always love our transformation team uh, always, you know, say this term over and over, fall in love with the problem. So. If we have a problem statement that we feel that, you know, the cost relating to produce a certain item is too high or it's not competitive anymore and we have to produce it or that we would like certain specifications of a production item, fall in love with the problem and get the data, get the insights on what drives it so that we have better solutions. Um, so it's essential for those aspects. These things play a critical role in us for us to, to understand our problems better so that we can come up with better solutions. And, you know, I think it's absolutely essential. And manufacturing, it's, yeah, it's part of life. It's uh, data literacy in, in any factory is, yeah, it's as important as being able to read nowadays. Okay. We have one uh, one question from Kumala, very aligned to the previous question, but very impactful question, okay? For some institution, that shift is seen as a burden and the cost of the company instead of a benefit for both the employer and employee. So as an HR practitioner, uh, how can uh, like Molo make them understand the shift is dynamic and it is required to the employees? Yeah, I, mean, I think this is also an essential part of an HR business partner's role in how do we challenge the thinking and how do we help our leaders open their minds to opportunity. Um, and this can be done in various ways, but I would use it and use the conversations that you have with your leaders to kind of prompt and challenge them on their future thinking. So in other words, how do they see the future of the organization? Where do they see the opportunities in the market? Where, what do they see as essential skills we need to build or capabilities we need to build in the organization? And I think normally through those kind of conversations, you start seeing the wheels move a little bit faster and the leader's head on the right wall. It's not just about my cost challenges right today. It's also about how do I shape this organization to be relevant 12 months, two years, three years, five years down the road. So I think it really starts with having those conversations. And what I always say to, people, to a lot of my HR business partners is we have to make those conversations human again. So remember, you are sitting next to a human being it's probably fearing his own understanding of what it means to be more digital or more analytical. So how do you also help them 
get the knowledge base and get the insight and feel more comfortable with what's happening in the market. Um, so you've got to deal with a person as a human being, and that human being comes with some fears, anxieties, and their own restrictions. I hope that helps. Okay. Thank you, Mario. Uh, we have another question from OKK. As an HR consultant who runs her own business, how do, how do I harness technology to attract more clients? How do I position my business to remain relevant? Yeah, I mean, I think always challenging and, and always it, 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 it talks about what segments or what aspects you want to deal with. But, I mean, I, I think there's a wonderful space in the market right now for HR consultants to help organizations with this journey. It's, it's very challenging oftentimes when you still sit in a traditional HR department that might be 10, 12 people where you have an HR director and an HR managers and you know, HR officers, et cetera. How do they fundamentally shift that to having a shared services capability with a chatbot that services payroll queries or leave queries and takes some of that repetitive work burden away from the HR consultants or HR managers that are busy having strategic conversations or dialogues with the business. So for any HR leader, that's quite a daunting journey to take not only themselves, but also the business through. And I think HR consultants can play a critical role in one is helping individuals through that journey, uh, but also how to understand the market. Okay. So we have one from Christopher. Uh, as so what is your advice to start to start up an enterprise for consideration of a potential of start with work principles as many of them remain conservative on ordinary way of just hiring the needed placement? What is your advice to start up enterprise for consideration of potential of start with work principle as many of them remain conservative on ordinary way of just hiring the needed placement? That's a question. Yeah, I mean, I, again, these are often change journeys, right? Um, and I think the the first comes or, or, or the first movers are always the ones that take the burden for creating the change, right? So um, it's 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 creating the need for it. It's 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 showing that to individuals and showing the benefit of it. Um, I mean, we've seen these shifts with everything, right? Where you know, there was a time when people would have said to you, smartphones won't exist in the future, or the fax machine has no lifespan, or, you know, emails will just be something people do at home. So every one of our big advancements always come a little bit with some resistances and blockages. But, you know, if you want to be a, a first mover on a new shift, well, you've got to take a little bit of the pain with moving. <laughs> okay. So we have uh, like we have a lot of questions. Let let us wind up with a couple of questions more. Mm. Okay, how do you think an HR person should look for when interviewing data analysts, and what skill set should uh, a the HR? One minute. One minute. I got. What do you think an HR person should look for when interviewing data analysts, and what skill set? should be there, the HR to be aware of? What skill yeah, an yeah. HR should be aware of? Yeah. I think this is always a challenging one. I mean, I think when dealing with any kind of quants or quantitative kind of fields, right, maybe data scientists or modelers or, um, or any of those kind of technical skills, I mean, it's on one side, obviously, we would love to check and make sure that they have the technical capability to deliver on the job. I think for me, it's always, it's that, that the other part is sometimes missing. In other words, oftentimes as a data scientist, once you built this incredible system or the incredible coding behind the data, you need to present it to a group of individuals. Or once you've, as a, a financial modeler, modeled a specific model, you need to explain the model or get feedback from the customer. So it's always a little bit of those human skills that go with all the technical skills. So for me, it's always, you know, one side, we've got to check the technical skills, but we also want to check those human skills in the sense of, can you problem solve? Can you translate complex concepts in a simplistic way to others? 
um, and can you learn? Thank you, thank you, uh, Mario. So with this, we'll wind up our session for today. Uh, there are a lot of questions coming up and we'll try to answer most of your questions. Uh, and we look forward for many sessions, Mario. Thank you for all the support you have provided. And thank you all attendees for being part of our webinar today and actively participating in our all polls and posting a lot of questions today. I know that uh, only a few of the questions are answered, but we'll always try to uh, come back to you all uh, with the answers for the questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And